Hey everyone, what's happening? This is Matt here on the Vinyl Head UK channel. And I've got another vinyl appreciation video for you guys. Now, I have a record next to me here by an artist that I've already covered once before on the channel. That record was the one after this one. That one I picked up pretty early on into my record collecting days. Whereas this one, I picked it up a few weeks ago. It's had a few spins, probably not as many as the, the record that followed this one. But it's had enough for me to sort of dive in and give my opinions back to you guys. So, without further ado, let me introduce you to it. It is, of course, Permanent Vacation by Aerosmith. An album that pretty much brought them back to the dance. They had a brief split. They reformed, they put an album out before this one. But then this is the one that gave them huge commercial success. As I say, kind of put them on the map, brought them back to the dance. And that trend followed on for a couple more albums after this one. Big, big commercial success. So this album was released back in August of 1987 by Geffen Records. This, though, is a 2016 UK reissue by Geffen and it is part of the Back to Black series. So not a first pressing, obviously. I'd like to get more first pressings. I'm not made of money, right? But I would like to go and get some more first pressings when I can. At the minute, I'm kind of concentrating on building up the collection and bringing this amazing music to me on vinyl. I have a huge CD collection, but I'm excited because it's like starting that collection from scratch again with the vinyl. But, you know, down the line, I would like to look at maybe some more first pressings and check those out and hear how good those sound. But yeah, 2016 uh, reissue by Geffen. And as I say, this is an album that had huge commercial success. It shaped an Aerosmith sound. The next couple of albums after this one followed that huge commercial peak for the band it's the first Aerosmith album that went silver and gold there wasn't any Aerosmith albums before this one that hit that it's gone on to sell a gazillion records in the states and gazillions and gazillions worldwide um it had pretty heavy rotation on the music channel so like on MTV back when MTV actually played music videos, um, it got very heavy rotation on that. It spawned three singles, I think it was, that ended up going and charting, and that was Ragdoll, Dude Looks Like a Lady, and Angel. So yeah, this, this album was huge. Now, some interesting little bits to the production side of it, and the management side of it. Geffen, as I say, who were Aerosmith's management and record label, you know, the band has always been notorious for drink and drugs. The Toxic Twins, of course, with Steven Tyler and Joe Perry, it's their nickname. Geffen made all five members of the band go through a drink and drug rehab program before they would put the money into doing this record. So Geffen were very serious about this. They wanted Aerosmith to succeed and get to the level that Geffen wanted on this record, which of course they did. They brought in Bruce Fairbairn to produce. Um, he was a very notorious Canadian producer who had worked with ACDC and Van Halen. Um, he, Bon Jovi was another one. He went on to re, uh, produce this and the next two Aerosmith Records following this to really get them that big commercial sound. Um, and it was also the first Aerosmith record where they brought in outside writers. All the content of the albums prior to this had been written by the band solely by Aerosmith. Whereas Geffen pushed for outside writers to come in and write these songs for the band, which you know, it's obviously worked as very, I imagine, difficult for the band who have always produced their own, you know, content material to then have 
outside people come and do that. Must be a very odd situation to be in if you're used to doing it a specific way. But it worked for them, you know, it really, really did. Um, as I say, with the the airplay, with the singles, silver and gold, this record went huge. Let's have a look at it. Let's show off this, this record right here. Show off some artwork for you. So it's pretty vibrant. Um, that big Aerosmith logo with permanent vacation underneath. And then this lovely black and red uh, artwork that we can see with various different pictures that are repeated a couple of times. Um, I can see like a Hawaiian lady. I can see cars and dice, spiders, guitars with money coming out. All sorts going on. It's quite a cool bit of artwork. Flipping it over, we have more of the same. So those pictures are repeated with spiders and the dice and the Hawaiian woman. Aerosmith logo thrown in there. Uh, the yellow is, of course, our track listing on side one and two. We have the band. We have our producers. Um, this was actually engineered by Bob Rock as well. So any Metallica fans will know Bob Rock. If you've ever seen some kind of monster, you'll know who Bob Rock is. Uh, he went on to work with uh, Motley Crue, for example, and various other bands. Our Geffen logo up at the top there. So pretty distinctive, it stands out. Which I want you to make a note of, you'll see why in a minute. Um, our inner sleeve, now I spoke about on Pump, which is a record after this one, it came in a plastic kind of uh, inner sleeve. It does the same on this one. I'm not a fan, I talked about it on Pump, and yeah, I'm not a fan because it has so much like debris on the record when you pull it out. It's very staticky as well. So all your dust and particles in the air stick to it. And it's still, even after several spins and whatnot, still comes out with little bits of white and that have come off this. And it's just, I don't like it. I'm not a fan. I like the paper sleeves. You don't get the static, you don't get the debris on the record, but, you know, I said before with Pump, I'd like to maybe get uh, some paper sleeves and just keep the inner sleeve in uh, with it all, because it is part of a package, you know, it's part of the whole thing, but just keep the record itself in a paper sleeve, just to stop it getting damaged, you know, the debris can easily start to cause little scratches, which then affect the play of a record. And, you know, one thing leads to another and you lose a great sound, really. But let's have a look anyway. So we have on the front here, we have Aerosmith in jail. Uh, a very 80s picture of a band behind bars right there. And then obviously our uh, album title and the Aerosmith logo again. And then flipping it over, we have our uh, lyric sheet right there on the back. A little picture of a band, uh, Steven Tyler in typical pose right there. And we have our lyric sheet, who it's written by, and then all of our usual um, credits over at the top there. Now, I said to make note of it being a pretty vibrant looking title, uh, sorry, a vibrant artwork. Excuse me there. But that's where the vibrancy stops. Um, you can see right there, it's pretty dull on the record itself. Uh, this was how Pump was, um, but it's pretty dull looking. We have Geffen, the Geffen logo, and then our track listing for both sides. Tiny little Aerosmith, tiny little permanent vacation. Yeah, it's kind of boring. There's not a lot to it. It looks kind of dull and boring when you're spinning it. Black vinyl, it's 180 grams, I might add as well. Um, just for anyone who was wondering. I'm going to slide it back in. You can already kind of feel the static as it goes back into this plastic sleeve. I'm going to pop that back in the outer sleeve there. Keep it nice and safe. So, um... Lineup of Aerosmith. Aerosmith, as I've mentioned before, is one of those bands that hasn't really changed lineup at all from the get go to now. 
But in case you don't know, let me tell you that Aerosmith is made up of Steven Tyler, who is vocals. He also plays harmonica. Um, it's listed him here as piano as well. And then we have Joe Perry and Brad Whitford on guitars. We have Tom Hamilton on bass and Joey Kramer on drums. And that lineup has pretty much from the 70s up until now stayed the same. Aerosmith are still going. I was reading things by Brad Whitford suge to suggest that maybe they wouldn't be playing for much longer. So if you get a chance to see Aerosmith, make the most of it because we may not be seeing them for much longer. Maybe in one-off gigs, but not so much as a touring band, it seems, which will be a shame. But, you know, all bands will get there one day. Track listing, side one, side A, Heartstone Time, Magic Touch, Ragdoll, Simariah, Dude Looks Like a Lady, and St. John. Side two sees Hangman Jewelry, Girl Keeps Coming Apart, Angel, Permanent Vacation, I'm Down, and The Movie. So that makes up our track listing. It's around 50 minutes in total, this record. Um, and yeah, it is very, I dare say, overproduced. It's very glossy, the production. It's very polished. Um, maybe overproduced is the wrong word, but it's that 80s big arena sound, which maybe, yeah, we could say it is slightly overproduced. Um, Heartstone Time, it starts with what sounds like whales or something like that. These weird noises. The guitar feedback comes in and then Steven Tyler comes in with his, I don't know how to describe it, his call. Cool. This weird vocal that he produces that only Steven Tyler can get away with. There's not many vocalists out there that could pull off Steven Tyler's vocal ability or what he phrases or produces. These weird uh, vocal calls and it's not scatting as such, but that sort of thing. And we're in. We're in to the record. Um, it's a good opener. It's not as good an opener as Young Lust on Pump. That's a bower. Um, I don't think this record is as good as Pump. My own opinion. I'm sure people might prefer this one to Pump. I personally prefer Pump. Uh, but yeah, then we go into Magic Touch, which is l like the most 80s sounding song. Um, it just, it kind of sounds a bit like Motley Crue. So Crue were about at this period in 87. Um, I know that Steven Tyler had interactions with Motley Crue and I think Crue's sound rubbed off a little bit. This is very Sunset Strip. This is very, very LA sounding. And I think they have s stolen or taken some influence from a crew sound. It's almost uh, a girls, girls, girls type sound to this track, I think. Um, but yeah, massively 80s. Like, this screams 80s. I know it's an 80s record, but it screams an 80s sound on Magic Touch. Um, going into Ragdoll, uh, we see brass appearing. So we have brass instrumentation appearing a few times on this um, record. We have it on the chorus and on the bridge. Um, Ragdoll really works. It's a great track. It's uh, one of my favourite ones on this. Uh, Simaraya, again, it's uh, a big arena rock sound to it. You know, um, I talked about the production, who's producing it. You know, he'd gone with Bon Jovi before and bands like that. Is this him trying to mould Aerosmith into that Bon Jovi arena stadium rock sound? I think it is a little bit uh, when you hear this. Um, Steven Tyler's vocals sound great. He's a, he's a great vocalist. He's one now that can still very much pull it off. There's other vocalists. I mentioned about Crew, Vince Neil. I don't think his vocals are as strong as they once were at all. There's other vocalists out there who, as they get older, their voice is not as strong. Ozzy may be another one. But Steven Tyler 
his vocals are still right there. They're still incredible. Rob Halford's another one who's in that league that his vocals are still amazing. But his vocal on this track really shines through. It is very, very strong vocal performance on Simaraya. Um, Dude looks like a lady. We all know about this track. We've got more brass in it. It is one of the most commercially successful songs that the band did. Uh, we've all seen the video for it and whatnot. Um, yeah, it's a great track. It's one that you're going to sing along to. Everybody knows Do Looks Like a Lady. Whether you know who Aerosmith are or a fan of Aerosmith, you're going to know this track. And then we go into St. John, which is quite uh, an old kind of bluesy-esque like Aerosmith from further back in the day, I think St. John is. Um, it, it's got this lovely swing beat on the hi-hat. It's just very bluesy. It's very laid back. Uh, it's got a really nice bass line going along with it. And yeah, it's it's kind of where you've got all this pomp arena rock sound. It's nice to go back a little bit and hear this bluesier sound from a band that, you know, were quite heavily influenced by blues music. Flipping it over onto Hangman Jewelry, uh, again, we carry on with a more bluesy feel. We've got the harmonica, um, and to be honest, it makes me visual. Not that I've ever managed to sit on one, because I haven't, but if I had a porch swing, if I had a porch, and then I had a porch swing on it, you'd probably find me on it listening to this track, because that's what I picture in my head. As I listen to Hangman Jewelry, I imagine just rocking back and forth on a nice swing on my porch is what it makes me think of anyway um we go back into uh swagger with girl keeps coming apart we go back into that pomp that stomp that swagger that aerosmith has more uh kind of arena rocks out it's got more brass to it we've seen brass a lot in this record already it comes back in this one and then we go into our classic power ballad. Aerosmith love a ballad. They love a power ballad. And this is the pinnacle of 80s power balladness. If you want to hear a stereotypical 80s power ballad rock song, look no further than Angel. It has everything that you could want from a power ballad. I'm not massively into power ballads. You probably know this by now from how I've spoke about having my face melted by records. But it's okay for what it is. It was very, again, commercially successful. It had the video, it had a lot of airplay. It was one of the singles. A lot of people like this. It probably brought a lot of people into the band as well who heard this big power ballad and thought, yeah, that's pretty cool. And go and check out some more stuff by Aerosmith. They were probably quite surprised listening to say Angel and then going back and listening to stuff from Rocks or Toys in the Attic or anything. They probably, it's a very different sound, but maybe it was a gateway in for some people. Then we go on to Permanent Vacation. And I have to say, this is the only time, maybe ever, but at the minute, it's the only time you're gonna hear steel drums on any of my records in my collection. We have a very Caribbean feel to Permanent Vacation with the steel drums playing there. It's a good track. It's just, yeah, it's kind of odd. But then if you're talking about vacations, you're gonna think about going to somewhere like the Caribbean or somewhere, and they're gonna play their steel drums. So add them in, why not? I'm down. So you Aerosmith fans out there will know that Aerosmith have done, uh, well, this is a Beatles cover. But you will know that they have done a Beatles cover already with Come Together, which sounds great. A really great cover of that track. Of an already amazing track. They've made it even more amazing. But this is a another Beatles cover. And again, it's a Beatles cover. I think they do very, very well. And then the movie, which ends the record, is an instrumental. Uh, it's got this... Um, weird feedback intro it has a female um voice speaking in a foreign language and then it has this very haunting guitar line that sits over it kind of disappears it comes back a little bit later in the track but it's very haunting just sits there nicely and just rounds off the record in an interesting way 
So, sound-wise, um, if you've seen me talk about pump, you will see that I loved that pressing and the sound of that pressing. The bass on that record is phenomenal. The sound and the tone coming through the speakers of the bass guitar is incredible, especially on Love in an Elevator, on those, mm, on those nice slides. It sounds just fantastic. Unfortunately, I don't think it's quite as good on Permanent Vacation for this pressing. I'd like to hear other pressings maybe and see if it sounds a little bit better. It's not awful by any stretch of the imagination. It's a little bit quieter, I thought, on the volume side than pump. I like to give my records a bit of welly to hear how, you know, they sound up loud, how they deserve to be. But I don't think it sounds quite as good. The production, as I say, is very glossy. Pump, not so much. It was a little bit rawer, which maybe had an influence coming through on the actual press. It shouldn't do, you know, the production shouldn't affect the sound of the pressing. You know, it's how it is cut. The pressing determines how it sounds. So, you know, production shouldn't really have any feature in that because you have different uh, pressings, some, and you know, different pressings, but same production, but some pressings sound a hell of a lot better than others. So production really shouldn't feature too much. You know, it's how it's cut the pressing that we're looking at and how it sounds. But yeah, not quite as good as pump. But as I say, by any stretch of your imagination, not bad. I'd like to have it a little bit more dynamic, especially having been treated to hearing that other record and, see it and hearing how good it sounds. But it's definitely not a bad sound. It doesn't sound digital, just not quite as analog as pump did or how pump sounds at least. Um, but it's still a good record. It's, if you love arena rock, if you love 80s arena rock, if you love your pump and your stomp and your hair rock and hair metal, then this is something you need to get your hands on, just like I have. Get your hands on it. So that is Aerosmith Permanent Vacation. Thankfully, they didn't stay on vacation. They produced some pretty damn good records after this one following up but there we have it so thank you all once again for checking this out don't forget to go and subscribe smash the like button hit the bell for all notifications there's plenty of social media activity going on with instagram and twitter so go and give those a follow but once again don't forget go and buy vinyl go and listen to vinyl i'll catch you guys real soon with more content have fun